Welcome to session two of our Cyber Masterclass series presented by MCPC and McDonald Hopkins. The Cyber Masterclass is a five-part in-depth webinar event that examines the cybersecurity landscape from multiple points of view and culminates with the anatomy of a data breach. Featured panelists in the field of cybersecurity law, technology, risk management, and communications from MCPC, McDonald Hopkins, Dixon Eaton, and Oswald companies will share their expertise along with professionals from the FBI, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, an independent arm of the Department of Homeland Security, and other distinguished guests. The series will take a holistic approach in examining the clear and present danger of cyber threats, legal and cyber risk imperatives, how your technology partner drives data protection, and incident response planning, all leading up to a fascinating finale, the anatomy of a data breach, which will include a live interactive simulation showing how all of these topics come together. Because all of these sessions are interactive, we encourage you to share your questions by emailing us at events at mcdonaldhopkins.com and look for links to breakout sessions where you will be able to speak directly with presenters about topics specific to your organization or industry. Session two understanding legal and cyber risk imperatives begins now. On behalf of MCPC and McDonald Hopkins, I want to thank you for joining us today for the second session in our five-part Cyber Masterclass series. My name is Jim Giszczak, and I'm the co-chair of McDonald Hopkins National Data Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice Group based in our Detroit office. With me on the panel today are Dominic Paluzzi, also co-chair of the National Data Privacy and Cybersecurity Practice Group at McDonald Hopkins, who is also based in Detroit, and Lacey Rex, who is vice president and cyber strategic leader at Oswald Companies and based in Cincinnati. All of us on the panel will be happy to address questions from the audience at the conclusion of the presentation today. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by emailing events at mcdonaldhopkins.com or by using the questions feature located in the GoToWebinar control panel. If you've submitted questions in advance of the program today, we'll try to cover those questions during our discussion. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Tom and Lacey, obviously we have a lot of material that uh, we wanna cover for everybody today. And one of the things that we wanna talk about and is really at the forefront and we get questions about all the time is planning. And far too often, uh, we find that organizations are not prepared because they haven't taken the time to plan for these types of events. They plan for you know, fires, they have fire drills, sometimes they plan for kidnap and ransom, but they don't seem to plan enough for data privacy and cybersecurity events. And as part of that planning process, you know, we have to think through, and I'd like to get your opinions on the team. And obviously when we talk about planning and the team, there's obviously an internal and an external component to that team. So Dom, I'll start with you. If you could uh, talk through, you know, when you look at new council organizations, who should be on their team both internally and externally? Sure. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having us today. Um, of course, cyber, right? We think of IT, right? We think of, uh, we think of legal often. And of course, both of those need to play a very active role, but, um, probably about 90 or so percent of the incidents that we counsel clients through um, are usually connected back to some sort of employee action or inaction. So an often missing team member is someone from human resources. So we want to make sure we have HR on the line. Um, we want to make sure we have risk, right, in order to uh, bring in the appropriate broker and carrier and the timing of all of that. So someone from risks should be on. Um, someone from finance, whether it's a CFO or someone in, in, in that similar position, especially now more than ever as we're faced with these very large uh, ransom demands and ultimately someone having to call a ball or strike call on whether or not to pay a ransom. Um, so we have HR, we have IT, we have finance, we have risk. Uh, physical security um, is another one, right? Sometimes we obviously have a, have a physical security issue. Um, and we want to make sure that not only our internal folks um, are, are well vetted and, and assigned their roles and part of the team, 
uh, and documented in the incident response plan, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But we also want to make sure we have our ex external resources available as well. Uh, external legal, outside privacy counsel, external forensic IT assistance, external restoration services. Um, and if we do need uh, to ultimately notify individuals, we want to make sure we have notification, call center, credit monitoring, um, and perhaps a, a crisis communication vendor ready to go as well to help us with any kind of messaging. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. And, and you know, obviously part of that team that is just critical is, is on the insurance side. Lacey, I don't know if you want to talk for just a minute about, you know, who on the insurance side needs to be involved and what their particular roles would be. Absolutely. Um, thanks again for having me. So cyber liability insurance is obviously, um, you know, very much intertwined and where it should be with your incident response plan, as Dom mentioned. Um, you should also be considering, too, do you have a hotline? Typically, most of the carriers have a breach coach hotline, which you can call, help vet any questions. You should have your broker's information because, um, you know, calling the hotline doesn't necessarily constitute reporting a claim. So to make sure you're in compliance, you need to make sure that you're doing that and um, reporting in a timely basis. It's also really important to bring your carrier in from the beginning so they can help and make sure that the policy works like it should. Um, oftentimes we find that sometimes clients just handle it on their own and then turn in an invoice. And unfortunately, it just, the policy won't work the way it should in that event. And you could ultimately um, invalidate any coverage that you would have. Uh, yeah, obviously very important. Um, I, I don't think that uh, folks are always thinking about that particular issue when they're in the heat of the moment. It's Saturday night and they're scrambling around and they may not be thinking, follow the appropriate steps. And you know, we'll talk a little bit about the steps and kind of the playbook that uh, that organizations should have. But, you know, Dom, I know you and I oftentimes when we're meeting with uh, organizations and counseling them. We also tell them to make sure that they've got backups, right? You know, and really stress that idea of a backup person for each of these roles, because, you know, you never know, as we know, all, all of us know all too well, when these events are going to occur uh, very often uh, at night, on the weekends, over the holidays. And if folks aren't available, we just can't hit pause on the event. Uh, somebody's got to be there from the team to fill that role to make sure that we continue and we move quickly and efficiently to help the organization. And obviously, if there's a key person missing, they've got to have a backup. So, you know, again, emphasizing how important it is to make sure that we've got a backup person for each of these roles and, and make sure we've got the contact information. You know, uh, we talked about, you talk about a hotline, Lacey, and obviously, you know, we want to make sure that if the system's down and we can't email the team, you know, how are we going to get a hold of the team? You know, do we have somewhere a piece of paper with you know all of their cell phone numbers so we can text everybody or you know if it's a large enough organization have a separate system set up for being able to text and, and get a hold of folks I know we've had many instances where email obviously is is down and there is no way to get a hold of the team so we want to make sure that we do have alternate methods to get a hold of the team you know and Dom I mentioned it but you know, as organizations are looking at this and they're, they're contemplating their team, just as part of their planning process, you know, what should they have relative to an incident response plan? Yeah, with respect to uh, the plan, right, we, we want to make sure it's our sort of break glass and, and, and grab and go, right? Um, so first, and, and we touched on it a little bit ago, but we want to make sure we outline um, the actual team members, right? Um, both those primary and the secondary team members for all of those uh, stakeholder and positions that uh, I talked about just a few minutes ago of IT and finance and risk and HR and marketing and uh, communications. Um, so we want to make sure we outline who is on the team. They're a little bit about each of their roles, primary, secondary, all of their contact information. Uh, from there, it, it really should be a bit of a triage um, and an escalation process and maybe some decision trees in there as to, hey, if this is happening or these systems are shut down or not uh, operable or not accessible, then maybe we bring in these folks, right, and do these tasks um, or check these things. So um, some decision tree, you know, I always say the, the incident response plan should be somewhere between a bar napkin and 50 pages. Uh, we don't want it to be 50 pages, that's probably too long, and a bar napkin probably too little, right? Uh, somewhere in between there. 
Um, we've seen both very effective bar napkin plans and 50 page plans, but we don't want to make it so expansive, right? And, and so voluminous that um, you literally aren't using it in the middle of an incident, right? Um, when these incidents hit, um, as has been mentioned, it's not Monday morning, 9 a.m. Not everybody's at their desk, so there's a lot of moving parts. Now more than ever with the enterprise-wide, very large ransomware, very large demands and extortion and exfiltration threats, there's a lot going on. So we need, um, that plan really needs to be our tool to keep everybody very organized. Um, the other thing that I'd like to see in the plan um, are some reporting uh, charts at the end that, allow us to kind of chart out and, and, and follow along with respect to the very key critical dates of discovery um, and you know the numbers of potentially affected, what systems are compromised. So those loggings uh, and those charts at the end of the, uh, of the plan uh, can also be very helpful. Yeah, and um, you know, it's, it's you know, kind of going back to what I mentioned earlier, you know, and you and I, we've seen this quite a bit, um, having that actually printed out, um, because how many times have we been on the phone with clients and, you know, we say, great, you know, have you implemented your plan? And they say, well, the, the plan's on the computer and everything's encrypted. I can't get to the plan. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that, that not only do they have it print off this, but print it out at home in case they can't log in. Again, back to the nights, weekends, and holidays. We want to make sure, and again, to Dom's point, that we have a, a good plan that encompasses everything that we need but is not so voluminous that nobody's ever going to want to take a look at it. The other thing I'll mention is that you know, we want to make sure that we periodically review the plan because how many times have we talked with clients where they pull their plan out, they dust it off, and they open it, it kind of cracks open and the first page that starts the list of people that are going to be involved, 80% of them are no longer with the organization. So it is definitely worth doing a, a regular review, at least an annual review of the plan. And I know we always encourage organizations to do this in conjunction with doing a tabletop exercise. And I know, Lace, you've been involved uh, in, in tabletop exercises where you've had the opportunity, obviously, and I know like to sit in and be part of that so that you're part of the process and are able to answer questions as folks are going through that simulation. So I don't know what your thoughts are on, you know, the frequency and, and the importance of going through those types of uh, processes and tabletop exercises. Um, absolutely. I agree at least once a year and, um, you know, changing up the format, obviously you want to make sure it's something new and uh, you're thinking of real life situations and scenarios that could happen. Um, carriers also like to see that from an underwriting standpoint, um, shows that you're preparing. Uh, I know we used the analogy earlier and we talked about breaking the glass, but you know, we have fire drills in school for a reason, right? So you know what to do and you work the plan and it's a seamless process. And the same thing goes for an incident response plan and a tabletop exercise if it's within um, you know, your, your general overview or and, um, risk profile as well. I think, um, you know, something too, this is a little outside of my lane, but um, Jim and Dom, I, I always talk to clients about the importance of engaging legal as one of the first steps, either through your insurance policy or if you already have a relationship, if you're self-insuring. I don't know, you know, obviously privilege, um, it's not necessarily, you know, a silver bullet in every situation, but I don't know if you could talk through that briefly. Yeah, sure. Dom, I don't know if you want to uh, kind of talk about timing and privilege. Yeah, we, we, we do want to make sure, you know, right, right after uh, your broker and your carrier are notified, we do want to make sure that Privacy Council's brought in a um, couple reasons. Obviously, privilege uh, to be able to cloak communications between the client uh, and us, and then any communications with any vendor, right? Uh, forensic assistance, restoration, if we are having to negotiate with a threat actor in a ransomware situation while those negotiations back and forth are not privileged uh, because they're with a third party, certainly all of our, the, our game plan or strategy, all of that, we want to cloak as much as we can uh, with attorney-client privilege so that that information is not discoverable. Uh, we have some really good case law, um, assuming that, the, uh, that it's set up appropriately. Uh, with the appropriate contracts um, and the appropriate scopes of work and, and MSAs, we really can uh, sort of cloak that entire process um, to, with attorney-client privilege. But even beyond the attorney-client privilege, certainly privacy counsel are going to have the best relationships to get those forensic firms on the line, um, get, the, you know, get the right vendors uh, in place 
we may have seen five of the same situation just this past few days. So we can sort of leverage that experience. And also to the extent that we need to bring in any law enforcement, um, we have context for that all around the country. Um, so it's, it's you know, helpful to really make sure that Privacy Council is really quarterbacking the entire breach response process. Well, that's that, that's exactly right. And I think that uh, the sooner that folks get brought in that deal with these issues every day, the better. And we've got, you know, countless stories of missteps that were made simply because the folks that were trying to figure things out didn't realize that something they were doing could impact the investigation. You know, we see all the time where organizations, they get hit with ransomware and they want to get up and running very quickly. And as a result, their IT folks may take everything and wipe it trying to get everything restored, not realizing that they're destroying the evidence, quite frankly, that we all need for a forensic investigation. You know, and Lacey, you mentioned one thing too that I definitely is worth following up on. You know, you mentioned about changing things up as it relates to the tabletop exercises. And I think that's very important because, you know, this area in particular is so fluid. Whatever the risks are that we're dealing with and that are the hot topic today, you know, next week, next month, next year, it's going to be something different. So continuing to change up that fact pattern, I think is very important because you do want folks that are you know, preparing for the actual events that they're seeing. You know, if they were to just sit back now and say, boy, we're just gonna prepare for you know, a loss of paper documents and that's it. Well, that would have that, that been great you know, 20 years ago, but uh, we still wanna be concerned about paper, uh, but there are many other things, obviously, that are at the forefront right now between ransomware, business email compromises, et cetera. So we do want to make sure that from a factual standpoint, you know, folks are updating uh, those fact patterns when they do their tabletops. Um, so let's move on to, to our next topic, you know, understanding legal compliance and kind of how this all relates to the, the threat. And, you know, Domino, you and I talk about this now later you do as well, just how convoluted this whole area is and just the patchwork of state and federal laws and all these different regulators that get involved. And then you layer on top of that obligations you may have contractually. So it really is a, a, a really uh, big bowl of spaghetti, if you will, that you're kind of trying to work your way through and, and figure out what to do and in what order and making sure that you're all of your statutory and contractual obligations. So, Dan, when we talk about uh, these types of concerns, you know, and, and we, you know, where, where do we start? I mean, organizations sometimes just say, you know, where, where, this is overwhelming. Where do I start? You know, do I start looking at my data? Do I look at my plan? You know, wh what triggers these obligations? You know, where, where, what's a good starting point? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, yeah, good starting point, obviously, bringing in your broker, bringing in your carrier, bringing in experienced privacy counsel. Um, the number one thing we always tell organizations on a, on a scoping intake call is we do not have a data breach, right? Very rarely um, do we know that we truly have a data security breach on day number one, right? Um, that is a very legally defined term. Um, it's very different in all of the, the state breach notice laws, which all 50 states have them now. And you may think, huh, I'm just located in New York. I only have to worry about New York. Um, I'm only in Ohio. Let's just look at Ohio. We look at state of residency of each affected individual. That's the state law that's going to govern. Um, and they all define what a breach is a little bit differently, but generally it's an unauthorized access and acquisition to very specifically defined personal identifiable information, such as social security numbers, driver's license, credit cards, bank account information. But on day one, right, when you're hit potentially with a ransomware situation or you're in the middle of a business email compromise matter, uh, while you may be suffering a, a data security incident or event or situation, right, we don't have a data breach. And we want to be careful about calling something a breach too early because that could start our discovery clock. And that's what starts our obligation to, to have to notify individuals within a certain amount of time, like 15, 30 days, 45 days. Um, so that's, that's on the state side. Certainly we have federal regulations, right? GDPR in finance, in finance. Uh, we have uh, HIPAA in, uh, in healthcare, right? Um, you have international laws of, of GDPR in the EU, right? PEPIDA in Canada. 
and they all have varying notice obligations, some as short as 72 hours, right? So we kind of have to do it while we may not know exactly what data is at risk right away, right? We need kind of a general understanding of, of sort of the data that an organization has, but a lot of those notification obligations under the statutes are not going to be triggered until we truly have discovered a breach, right? Where we're seeing um, the real fast track notice obligations, um, two areas, certainly with PCI, DSS, payment card industry data, security standards, whenever we have a potential compromise of cards and payment cards, we have to be giving notice to acquirers, processors, merchant banks, and the card brands uh, within, you know, 48, 72 hours um, under PCI. So that's always been, you know, around for, for years, that's fast track. Where we're seeing sort of a newer, real fast paced obligation is under the contracts because some of those contractual provisions that we read are so broad right that any sort of potential security incident or potential for data leakage or acquisition uh, requires a notification obligation so one of the first things we're talking about on the call uh, is what contracts could be in play here because we need someone to pull those figure out are we potentially triggering any of them uh, that would require one of these advanced uh, notices. So they're a lot quicker than the laws. Uh, the laws we will get to, first we wanna make sure we're contained, have our arms wrapped around the situation, and then we will truly discover the breach once we have discovered the personal information that's compromised. But look out for those contracts because those provisions could really fast track our notice obligations. And you know what, Tom, I wanna I want go back real quick on on one of the things you said, You know. When you start this process for any organization of really taking a look at, you know, data, you know, this really goes back to that planning piece, right? Because you know, we always talk to clients about, you know, ask the three simple questions of, you know, what data do you have, where is it, and who has access to it? And organizations, you know, they have data everywhere. And, and most, you know, I've yet to come across an organization that can answer that, those three questions accurately because we all know what ends up happening. They decide to get new equipment. So they take all the old devices, they put them in a back room, they bring out the new equipment. You know, have the old devices been properly wiped? No, usually not. Um, you know, we've had cases where they've decided to give or sell for a dollar the equipment to their employees and somebody goes home and lo and behold, as their kids are logging into the computer, you know, the HR files are popping up and uh, somebody's taken home all the HR information mistakenly. Uh, you know, and so that's really an important thing that for an organization to wrap their head around. The other thing that you mentioned, you know, when you talk about this myriad of, of laws that are out there, you know, I think one thing too that we just can't emphasize enough is just how this changes and how quickly these laws change. And they're just constantly very fluid. And, you know, as, as we see this, these changes kind of sweep across the country where, you know, we see something in California kind of works its way across or on the East Coast and works its way across. You know, we do, we do need to make sure that, you know, folks continue to stay informed as to what are their obligations? What do they need to be doing? And as we all know, what we're starting to see more and more is that those obligations are going to the proactive side of things. So one of the things, Dom, you know, and we've talked about, Lacey, is that, you know, the state statutes across the country and really around the, around the world are pushing all organizations to be more proactive. You know, up to this point, you know, you look at the state breach notification statutes, very reactive. Now we're starting the push to be proactive. You know, certain states, for example, that, uh, you know, if you're doing proactive things you can use as a defense in a lawsuit, for example, or if you're not doing the proactive things that are required, of course, you could find yourself in trouble with the state AG's office. So as, as we continue to monitor and work, you know, with these statutes and work with clients, we do want to draw everybody's attention to the fact that they are going to have to be much more proactive than they have been to date so that they can avoid some of that potential exposure and liability. And Lacey, I don't know what you're on the insurance side kind of discussions you've been having, you know, with, with your insureds over these types of issues. So, yeah, absolutely. We're also talking about biometric laws as well, um, especially if you're retail, because you're oftentimes using some sort of biometric to log, you know, log in and out. Um, we also see quite a bit of activity really with the contracts. And I, I believe oftentimes the insurance provision is overlooked. And 
I, you know, it, it always has a pretty tight um, time limitation on some on more sophisticated contracts. Uh, for instance, I've seen 72 hours. I think they're doing that because of some sensitivity. They're doing that for sensitivity to GDPR. Um, but it ultimately really is, as Dom was mentioning, it's really hard to just sort out what happened. Um, it, you know, was it an incident? Was it a system failure? You know, what happened? And just get your arms around it. So the expectation to notify your clients within 72 hours, I just think is unreasonable. Um, oftentimes I see a lot of additional wording um, or, you know, in each claim type of a situation rather than an aggregate limit. And it's, it's really pretty amazing what people put in the contract. So, you know, oftentimes talking to clients, we need to be pushing back on the insurance provisions and obviously working alongside outside counsel to also be reviewing the rest of the contract as well. And, and Lacey, you bring up a great point and Don, maybe you can comment on, you know, the whole contract, all the contractual issues that we see. And, you know, in particular, when we're working with our clients and they're working with vendors, and the types of provisions, obviously, that we like to see because we want to make sure that they're thinking about it on the front end, not scrambling on the back end. Sure. Yeah, sp specifically with vendors, and, I, and we'll get to them in, in just a little bit, but we want to make sure that, you know, for those vendors that truly have a good deal of your personal identifiable information that you're passing on to, um, unfortunately, it's still on uh, you as the, the entity that takes in that data. You ultimately have the legal obligation. You can contract away some of that, some of that notification obligation, but it's really on you. And so to that end, we want to make sure we have really tight provisions um, on notification of a potential incident, because if we allow the vendor 30 days, for instance, to, to give us notice, um, we could arguably be stuck with their timeline such that if we have a 30 day either statute or, or contract and we learn about it from them on day 30, we could arguably uh, be in violation uh, of the contract, uh, be in breach of that, uh, be in violation of the statute if it's got a, a 30 or plus uh, or 30 or less uh, notice provision. So we want to make sure that uh, we have a, a, a short, maybe like 72 hours or less notice provision. Uh, we want to make sure that if the vendor takes it in and then passes it on to a sub-vendor, subcontractor, we want to make sure that we're notified of that. We've had so many breaches, especially lately, um, when almost a third of, of incidents are arising from a third party, from a vendor. But it's, we, we often, our client doesn't know that the other subcontractor, sub-vendor was even involved and had their data, right, until the breach happened. So we want to, A, be uh, put on notice if a, if a vendor is utilizing another vendor to pass on that data, uh, and B, have us, you know, get the option for us to either say a no to that or at least do some auditing and vetting of them. Um, and I would also say that we want to make sure that we're getting in writing what's supposed to happen at the termination of the vendor relationship. Um, so many times, you know, we're entering into a contract with a vendor, maybe it's a, a standard agreement, and, you know, it's, it's often difficult to talk about the termination of a contract when you're, you know, sort of everything's great and, and we're talking about the beginning of a contract, but what happens when either you terminate your relationship or you no longer need their service? We want to make sure that this data, especially PII, PHI, PCI data, is not just sitting out there uh, uh, in a you know server of, of one of our vendors that we haven't used for five, 10 years. So having some really tight provisions on either the return or destruction of data and getting some certificate of, ass of assurances back from these vendors that your data is indeed uh, you know, been deleted permanently off their system. Now, those are, uh, those are great points, Dom. And I think that uh, data management, as you mentioned, is just really critical. And it's an excellent point that at the end of those relationships, most organizations do not go back and ensure that their data has been recovered or destroyed or check the, their contract to see who's got what obligations. So very important to do so, however, because that liability sits out there and you know, if nothing, we've learned that it's real easy to just go out and get another server and more storage space to, to pack in a lot more data. You know, you don't have to worry about getting that monthly bill every day, every month from Iron Mountain, you know, reminding you of how many boxes of data you have sitting there. So, you know, we do find that folks have a tendency to just save everything 
And uh, they do need to have good data hygiene here and make sure that they're going through, knowing what they've got, getting rid of things that they don't need. Far too often we find that data breaches are much larger than they should be, simply because there's a lot of old data that should have been destroyed long ago that folks have held on to. All right, uh, as we move through uh, onto our next topic, obviously one that is, uh, is very critical and very important, one that folks need to always hear about and, and take into consideration, Lacey will ask, this is your section uh, on insurance. So give everybody just a little flavor of what they should be thinking about when it comes to the appropriate type of insurance, amount of insurance, what's covered by insurance typically, and how they should use that when they have an incident. Sure. So, you know, from a very basic standpoint, I like to think of a cyber liability insurance policy as an outsourced disaster recovery plan, right? You've got, you pick up the phone and it, it sort of works itself out, especially if you don't have all the vendors that you need um, or the established relationships already, your insurance policy is gonna do that for you. Um, I think it's a little bit of a misconception that it has to be a malicious attack on your system too. Um, there's a coverage extension called system failure. I've had clients that have had these types of claims as well, where it could be simply, um, could be a third, part, third party provider and they're patching or you're patching and something just goes wrong and you're down for a certain amount of time. The policy will actually respond to a non um, a non-malicious event on your system. So, I, and I think it's really important too to think about cyber liability as it's theft of data. Oftentimes money can be stolen, but that's really better suited under a crime policy, which is you know covering the theft of money itself. When I think about limit adequacy, it's a little bit of an art still, not quite as much of a science. So there's a couple different factors that go into it. Um, so there are cyber data analytics tools um, that will scan your network to help you determine the appropriate limit. Um, that helps, but it's not necessarily perfect. There's also benchmarking that you can do. What are your peers of a similar industry purchase? Uh, it's also driven by contracts. Honestly, I see a lot of limit requirements based on your largest client and what they're telling you you need to carry. So oftentimes that's a big uh, part of the insurance provision. Um, we also look at what kind of um, information too that we're getting from those scanning reports that'll help do about 10,000 years of simulated losses to actually determine what's the appropriate limit for your organization and from a business interruption and a notification. There's also breach cost calculators as well. So those are some of the limits. But when I think about a cyber liability policy, it's really first party and third party coverage. We talked a little bit about liability. So you're outsourcing the function not necessarily the liability. Um, there's the media portion of the policy, the privacy and security, um, transmitting malicious software to a third party would be a situation that would be covered under a policy. Uh, regulatory fines and penalties were insurable by law and um, any kind of PCI fines and assessments as well. When it comes to the first party coverage, that's where we see a lot of innovation and a lot of growth in that space in particular. So that's going to be the extortion, typically on a reimbursement basis. Uh, it's also going to be the legal forensics, um, computer forensics, and it's also going to be the PR as well. So those are all sort of bundled in. Um, one of the biggest components is the business income loss. And I think it's also a common misconception that your property policy would respond to a cyber liability incident. It won't necessarily, it's really better suited under a cyber policy but if you do have a business income loss as a result of a non-physical business interruption, so malicious attack on your network or non-malicious for a system failure, the policy is going to respond um, and will compensate you for loss of business income. Oftentimes these claims are very complicated and cost of a forensic accountant are also included to help you determine what your out-of-pocket costs were. So that's sort of cyber liability insurance in a nutshell. Well, what, one of one of them is just as you were talking through this, you know, one of the things we're seeing is a very big increase in class action litigation, whether it's because of, you know, a biometric case, just, a, you know, a data breach of personally identifiable information or protected health information. How is that impacting your analysis when it comes to coverage amounts? 
So from a biometric standpoint, we look at the number of records that you have, and that's one of the tools to help determine what's the most appropriate limit. But from a class action lawsuit, really honestly, um, in that situation, you know, we try and go out with an aggressive limit from the beginning, especially because we're seeing a drastic increase in the amounts of the extortion and the cost to actually remediate and restore are also getting very expensive as well. We see a little bit of an overlap between property policies and cyber policies where we see um, physical devices actually being bricked. Um, so they're corrupted to such a point where we can no longer restore them, we just have to replace them. So the cost, especially if you're a manufacturer, can be really expensive for these complicated manufacturing equipment. And you know, another uh, point that we run into every day as well is just these increasing amount of ransom demands. You know, those numbers have just gone up exponentially. So I assume that too is something that, that you're considering as you sit down and chat with insureds about the amount of coverage that they might need. Yeah, absolutely. I never would have thought that I would say a million dollars just isn't enough. But, you know, when you get into these situations, a few years ago, we were seeing extortion amounts in the twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 range. It wasn't too crazy. Some were higher, but on average, it wasn't necessarily... You know, we were in the six figures now. I mean, I feel like the jumping off point is a quarter of a million, if not higher. Uh, we've actually seen some of our um, carriers actually approve extortion um, reimbursements within the range of like 800,000 and all within 24 hour period. So unfortunately it comes down to a business decision and your insurance carrier is never gonna say you have to pay it. Um, they're, they're going to ultimately leave it up to the insured, but it really comes down to a business decision. Is it gonna take longer to restore from backgrounds? Are they viable? Um, a lot of times too, we're seeing where data is actually being exfiltrated. Even if you do restore, your information is probably going to be put out on the internet. So, you know, those are all factors that need to be taken into consideration. Well, yeah, and you bring up a great point. That is definitely one of the, uh, you know, latest and greatest we've seen this year is, you know, the, all the events where, you know, folks do have viable backups, but unfortunately the attackers taken their data before they encrypt on the way out. And folks want to pay for lack of a better term, hush money to, to keep the data off the dark web. So we, we've definitely seen many instances of that uh, over the past year. Um, one other question or, or thought comes to mind is, is you're, you know, you're doing all this in the front end with insureds and you're trying to help them come up with an appropriate amount of coverage, you know, what should they be thinking about or how often should they be reviewing this with you in order to stay current? Because this is so fluid and things are changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, I look at enhancements for the cyber liability coverage every year. So if you're not getting, high, you know, a couple bullet points at least of these are the enhancements, your broker's probably not doing enough for you. Um, if you're seeing a retroactive date on your policy, that needs to go away, uh, especially if you've been with a carrier for a long period of time. I don't think that's necessarily a, a, a problem, having an established relationship with the carrier, but if you've had your policy in place for a number of years and for whatever reason it has a retroactive date, it should be a full prior acts policy. You should see a continuity date or prior impending litigation date, or you should not see a retroactive date. Uh, especially if you're a new policyholder, um, oftentimes there's a lag between when the incident occurs and when you're actually aware of it. So obviously that can be problematic. Um, I, I also look to various enhancements, like is there betterment coverage? Do we have voluntary shutdown coverage? Are there, um, what is the control group? So the knowledge of a claim, is it any insured or is it just the C-suite, which is what I would recommend. Um, it's also, dependent business interruption. Is it limited to IT providers? Do you have to schedule them? Um, or is it non-IT providers? So basically anyone you have a written contract with and because they are down, they're affecting your business. Um, you know, these are all things that we look to evaluate. Is there bricking coverage? Is there a supplement? Um, is there a supplement for crypto jacking? You know, I, I could drone on for quite some time, but those are all things that should be taken into consideration I also like to limit the application um, and the amount of information that they're underwriting to, to the current policy term, wherever and whenever we can. It's also really tricky when you're moving to a new carrier because um, 
you want to make sure if there's if there's any notices of circumstances that you should make. There's also wording like given and accepted by the previous carrier that's important. You want to make sure if you're moving, you have that kind of wording. So there's a lot of nuances to it. And I think oftentimes what is overlooked as well is the loss control resources available with the cyber policy. Some of the carriers have very robust offerings. So it's not only just looking at the coverage, established relationship with claims handling, but it's also could you offset some of your cybersecurity budget with your cyber liability policy? Um, you know, it's a win-win for both parties. The insurance carriers want you to be a better risk and, um, and utilize those services. And then you get the bonus of maybe getting some resources for free as well. Well, I, I will say one thing. Uh, every time we chat, uh, I do learn a lot more about your process. And I think it just is is just cements the fact that folks need to be talking to somebody that truly that they do understand this coverage because uh dabbling in it not a great idea um they do need somebody like yourself that can go through and ask all the appropriate questions and make sure they have the appropriate coverages because you know the last thing that anyone wants is for them to realize they do not have the appropriate coverage you know uh, saturday night when they're scrambling making those calls trying to figure out what to do in the middle of a ransomware event so it is very important to, to talk to somebody who is knowledgeable. And um, that's a, a great start of a discussion and explanation of all the things that folks need to be thinking about. Um, I know, Dom, we've got uh, probably along the way a few stories, a few, uh, you know, we'll keep the names of the innocent uh, out of them, <laughs> of course, but uh, a, f a few things that we can just give uh, by way of example, uh, just as, as some things where organizations may have been in a better position, you know, maybe if they would have done something or not done something. And again, we always like to use our anonymous stories just uh, for folks so that hopefully they can learn from them and, and not make those same potential missteps that, that, others, uh, that others have made. And, you know, I started out, and I know it's one we've seen regularly, but, you know, where folks do bring in, uh, you know, their local vendor or their own internal folks, and they start trying to rebuild and, and you know clear things out and get the business back up and running, not realizing that they are in fact destroying uh, the evidence that we're gonna need for forensics, et cetera, which can be very critical uh, very quickly. Um, but some of the other things, Dom, that we've seen that you know is just kind of pointers that folks should be thinking about when they're faced with these types of events. Sure, and, and I know we mentioned earlier, but, but uh, certainly wanna reemphasize when we establish the team and then we have a, a well-crafted incident response plan. We wanna make sure we're testing that plan and testing the team, right? Going through exercises. And one of the things that I always bring up when we're doing a tabletop exercise is how is the team communicating, right? And the number one answer I always get is, well, we just shoot around emails, right? Um, and sometimes there's a group incident response team email. Sounds great, right? Um, Two times just this past uh, week, um, our team has dealt with some, some uh, deal with a lot of large ransomware and enterprise-wide ransomware, but this happened twice this past week, where in the middle of the threat actor negotiations, uh, we were trying to uh, tell the threat actor that, you know, hey, we just, we don't have that much uh, in, in the way of, uh, of finances to be able to, to finance this transaction and, you know, how low can we go? going kind of back and forth. And uh, on two separate occasions, Threat Actor came back and said, well, um, I know you have attorneys and you have a, uh, a forensic firm that we all know of and you have a cyber policy. So uh, we know you have limits of $2 million and we think you can you know, fork over some money to us to, uh, to pay the ransom demand. At the end of the day, these Threat Actors um, were in the email, uh, within the email environment, the email tenant, and reading all of the emails between the incident response team. So lesson learned there is that we wanna make sure that we are having an out of bandwidth communication, right? Getting some sort of even text messaging is better than email. Picking up the phone, that's probably the best, right? Old school, uh, but having some sort of messaging app um, where we are utilizing that to communicate with everybody uh, instead of just utilizing regular email, right? Um, because they could potentially be in there and they've, they've shown just this past week uh, that they are indeed tracking uh, communications. And 
you know, when you pick up the phone, I always say, don't leave a voicemail, right? Because that leaves an email then in, in most environments. So um, making sure we have an established communication mechanism for the team. Um, but even outside of the team, right, in these large ransomware events where um, most workstations, computers, they're not accessible. So if we need to get a message out to the the employees, right, those that are not on the incident response team, and maybe it's, hey, we're working on it, this is a confidential matter, don't be talking about it, don't be posting on social media, or maybe it's some sort of technical action item, we want to have a, a communication method for them as well. So never too early to start thinking about how are we going to communicate with our um, stakeholders, right? Our employees, our ambassadors, so we need on our side. How are we going to communicate with them uh, to give them some assurance that we're handling this and if there's steps for them to take, how are we gonna get that message out? Uh, so it's never too early to kind of think about that. Um, along the lines of ransomware, um, and we've talked a lot about that today, but it's because it's, it is, it's the most prevalent threat uh, it's it's ever increasing in demands. We're, as, as Lacey indicated, we're seeing you know million dollar demands uh, almost daily. Um, and I, and we always tell our clients you have three doors, right? You have the option of uh, trying to restore from backups, potentially rebuilding, or door number three, which we never want to go down and go in, but we often have to, and that is negotiating and ultimately paying uh, the threat actor. Um, but you know. Going down that road, we want to make sure that we understand, you know, what is the budget, what is, you know, what, what is the organization willing to pay, what's the max, um, what, what's the minimum. Uh, but these groups now um, are getting very bold. So for organizations that have very viable backups, we have a couple of groups out there like Mays, Soda Nakibi, um, and they, what they're doing is that they are taking your data before they deploy the ransomware throughout the environment. They're taking your data, exfiltrating that data, and then either posting it to their sort of wall of shame leaked site, um, a website where they post their latest victims, or they threaten to post that. And it's either you pay us and we'll take it down, or if you don't pay us, uh, then we're going to post your data. Um, and oftentimes it's not, you know, it's not really the personal identifiable information that's really at risk because oftentimes, um, you know, that data is either secured or not part of the environment that's been encrypted, uh, but it could be from some very strategic uh, and, and confidential trade secret information. It could be covered defense information. Um, so, you know, that's really become a growing risk um, is, the, is the exfiltration and the posting of the data um, that, you know, has is, is really caused major concern um, and really accelerated the entire uh, response process. Yeah, um, now those are, uh, the, yeah, the, yeah, those are, those, those are, those are all frightening. And uh, yeah, I know things that we see every day, but uh, yeah, continue with uh, the others because I know that uh, <laughs> hopefully the, these are things that uh, folks listen to and if they find themselves in these circumstances, you know, they can remember some of these uh, nuggets of information and hopefully avoid a, a misstep or two. Yeah, the the internal uh, sort of the rogue employees or, you know, employees that uh, sometimes uh, don't realize they're, they're doing any kind of harm, right? Um, and I have a great one, um, a very longstanding employee, um, and she, you know, sort of come in early every day and, 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 and do her job uh, for this organization. Um, and she come to find out uh, she had a bit of, a, of an addiction, a lottery addiction. Um, and so what she was doing for, for many years is that she would call someone on the phone and rattle off a bunch of phone numbers, uh, which would then, we came to find out, would be utilized as, a, as numbers for easy pick for her lottery addiction. Um, unfortunately, she was using employees' social security numbers um, to come up with her easy pick combination of numbers, uh, passing them on to whoever was on the other line on the phone who was ultimately buying these tickets. And so, you know, not a very technical compromise, right? And one where maybe there's no intent to do harm, but the problem is that you're, you're utilizing information for which you're you know, otherwise in a position, an authorized position, but then you're using it for an unauthorized reason. 
passing that information on, right? And she never thought anything of it. Hey, I'm just using these combination of numbers. Um, the other breakdown is that all of the, you know, tens and twenties of employees that were around her hearing this, uh, you know, on a daily basis for, for so many years, not doing anything about it until someone finally reported it. Um, and unfortunately, that's a breach, right? And that goes to kind of a misconception where we always have to have kind of a, you know, A, it's always got to be an electronic hacking of data from a threat actor group. And that's not the case, right? Just sort of the unauthorized use, unauthorized access, um, even an inadvertent disclosure, right? Oops, you send the, you know, the wrong fax, the wrong email to the wrong person. All of those are still data breaches and they could be in a hard copy, right? Uh, it doesn't need to be electronic data. The statutes for the most part have all sort of gone back and amended those. Um, and so we need to kind of, while these, you know, the ransomware threats, the business email compromise threats are certain very, certainly very common. Um, there's a whole host of other compromises out there and data breaches that we have to make sure that our incident response team, you know, is ready to, to respond to. Uh, even if they're not the most technical uh, breaches, we still have to respond to them often the same way um, as we do with, uh, with any other kind of, you know, more malware uh, enterprise-wide uh, hacking event. Well, Dom, uh, thank you. It's a lot. Um, you know, I want to uh, definitely thank um, Lacey and Dom for their comments, and I know we're going to open it up to uh, any additional questions that may come in. Um, so please forward your questions so that they can be answered, and uh, to the extent you have follow-up, we can certainly follow up with you as well. Um, Joining us now uh, for today's Q&A, we're fortunate enough to have uh, Gunnar Wag, Security Principal at MCPC, and Matt Barquette, Chief Client Officer at Dix & Eaton. We thought it'd be useful to get their insights on some of the things that we've talked about today. Um, and I know that some of the issues that we've discussed uh, resonate with both Matt and Gunnar as they've had to deal with these issues as well from their perspectives. Certainly want to get their input. Um, Matt, I know we touched on the important role of crisis communications and kind of a communications playbook. Were there any key points that struck you that you could expand on from the crisis communication perspective? <clears throat> it's a great question, Jim, and thanks for the opportunity to, to address it. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 the concepts that really resonated, the topics that really resonated with me are the, are the topics around uh, creating a plan you know, to address cyber incidents and then testing against the plan, you know, using regular update opportunities annually um, and then also using the, the tabletop exercise components. And, you know, there, there's a and lot hopefully of my uh, my lead in to, to Matt went uh, went through. I'm not yeah, sure. This is Dom. We can hear you. Thanks. OK, uh, great. Uh, now I just remember where I was. Uh, and from a, from a communications perspective, um, including communications components uh, in, those, in those drills is really important. So um, it's just as one example, if, there's, if there are social media elements of, uh, of the data breach, like say, say for example, the data breach or the cyber event emerges on social, the, um, you know, company finds out about a, a data breach internally, you're doing all the things that you need to do to address it, and then suddenly a blogger finds out about it and, and outs you before maybe, in oftentimes cases, um, <clears throat> that you're not ready to talk about it publicly yet. Um, <clears throat> being able to test how you how you respond in those situations, and, and you know, what do you do? What is, what is your strategy going to be? Are you going to get on social media and make an announcement? Are you going to uh, leverage a reporter um, that maybe follows your industry? And those are sorts of things that um, all can be addressed in advance uh, so that you at least have a philosophy down so you're going to know how to communicate if and when the time comes. Um, so th those are some of the things that, that kind of resonated for me as I was listening to the, the program, Jim. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. And uh, yeah, sorry about stepping on you there. Of course, as <laughs> luck would have it, my my audio went out as uh, as you were trying to talk. So gotta love uh, gotta love technology, but uh, the world <laughs> we're in these days. Brave new world. Awesome. 
Yeah, we can't all sit around the table like we used to. So I'm going to kick it over to Gunner. Um, Gunner, I, I know you've been uh, listening to to all of these really important points that were raised over the last hour, and I know that you see them uh, obviously in, in a little different perspective given your role. What what are some of the key issues you know that you heard that uh, you're seeing with your clients at MCPC? That's a great question, and, and thanks for the time. And, and I'll, I'll piggyback on some of Matt's comments as well. And, and the one thing that stuck out to me is is just being proactive. I think in you know across this country, uh, we see too many companies that uh, are sitting around and waiting for something to happen. And you know maybe they have an IR um, you know, company that's an IR retainer, but you're still in reactive mode, waiting for something to happen. You're not in that kind of proactive space like the speakers talked about, trying to get ahead of the threat. And part of that is is to to kind of uh, put stop what Matt said is you know hey look, having that that IR plan is is critical right and defining what the problem is what may be coming practicing and exercising that motion you know through tabletop exercises with your with the appropriate personnel across your company so when it happens not not if but when you're ready for it so that it really minimizes the impact on your organization. And goes from something that's potentially catastrophic to something that's hey we can handle pretty quickly, not really disrupt business operations and keep moving forward uh, as an organization without uh, spending uh, a significant time and energy and, and financial resources trying to uh, mitigate uh, something uh, that's really going to damage the organization in the short and long term. Excellent. Um, thank you uh, for that in that insight. Certainly appreciate it. Um, I'm going to ask um, Lacey just a couple of questions. Lacey, you know, as you look at these different coverages, you know, oftentimes I get clients that, you know, ask, you know, what what else is covered? You know, isn't this covered by some other policies, et cetera? You know, what what do you recommend? You know, should clients be coordinating their cyber liability policy with other coverages? Yes, um, thanks. It's a great question, Jim. So we do see an overlap oftentimes of crime coverage. Um, I think it's important to distinguish that crime coverage is theft of money and cyber is theft of data. However, we're oftentimes seeing some cyber crime extensions under the cyber liability policy. So there is overlap. Um, I do believe it is important that we affirm coverage under either of the policies, if possible. I, it's better suited under the crime policy, but sometimes there's a lack of coordination there, so that's really important. There's also an overlap between the property coverage, which sounds really weird, but um, there is oftentimes extensions, or there should be extensions for what's called computer hardware replacement cost coverage, or bricking. It's when Electronic equipment, this could be manufacturing equipment, this could be printers, USB drives, et cetera. It is compromised to such a point during the actual um, cyber incident, so ransomware, some sort of malware spreading throughout the network, that you, it can no longer be restored. Um, it actually has to be completely replaced. So that's the overlap between the property policy and the cyber liability policy. So coordination, understanding um, if there is coverage, if you have duplicate coverage, is there a way to save a little bit of money on premium? Those are all really important. Excellent. Thanks, Lacey. We, we've got a number of questions. Another one that came in, uh, which is coming back to you, is how do you determine the right insurance limit for your organization? So um, it's a combination of things, right? So we want to look at um, contracts that you have with your clients. Uh, what are you being required to carry? Usually that helps drive, especially if it's a sizable limit. Um, we're also using cyber data analytics tools. What it's doing is it's scanning your domain um, and understanding from a risk management standpoint, do you have any weaknesses? Do you have any vulnerabilities running these um, simulated losses to determine what's your average loss going to be um, and what's your worst case scenario? So those are all effective. And then there's the traditional tools like Advisum that we use uh, for benchmarking. And that's really um, comparing companies of a similar size and revenue to you um, and what they currently purchase as well. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dom, the, uh, another question that came in had to do with, are we seeing an uptick in litigation and regulatory fines and penalties following uh, a data breach? Sure, thanks, Jim. 
Yes, we, we are. Um, with respect to litigation, we're seeing a significant increase, not only in class actions, especially as a result of healthcare data breaches. Uh, it seems as though folks would rather have their financial credit card, social security number out there than their diagnostic information. So certainly an uptick in class action, specifically in healthcare, coming from uh, those uh, individuals um, who are notified uh, of an incident. But uh, secondly, we're certainly seeing an uptick in litigation between uh, business to business, right? So a downstream client who, for example, is impacted uh, by a managed service provider, for instance, right? Or a common vendor. Um, we're seeing an uptick in that sort of lit that sort of litigation. On the regulatory front, um, you know, more and more these state AGs, uh, the Office for Civil Rights with Health and Human Services, it's a jackpot for them, right? We always ask these regulators, what do you do with all these the dollars from the fines and penalties? And their response is, we hire more auditors, right? It's sort of this self-policing and self-funded. So um, we're certainly seeing more and more regulatory investigations. And even if they eventually, we have great success, uh, knock on wood, to helping our clients through those investigations with very little to, to no fines and penalties. But even putting aside the the lack of penalties, it's a it's an onerous data request intensive process. So these regulators um, utilize a data breach as an opportunity for you to have to you know sort of vet your dirty laundry, if you will. Basically, show us what you have in place, right? So oftentimes these data requests are totally irrelevant to the actual breach that you know required the notice to the state ag for instance but they'll come in and, and want to see you know risk assessments risk analysis vulnerability testing results for the last five years they want to see all of your training right what are you doing for those that are are you know maybe not passing those track those tests that accompany the training so it's an opportunity for the regulators to really do a deep deep dive and some due diligence on your organization, uh, ensuring that you have those sort of proactive pre-breach measures in place. Thanks, Tom. Um, another question that came in that I think uh, probably both Gunnar and Dom um, can answer, and that question was, you know, if you've got a, a good or robust IT department internally, do we still need to have an outside forensic firm come in to conduct analysis if there's a data incident? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start and turn it over to Dom. And I, I would think yes. I mean, you may have a, you know, a very robust IT department, but you know, you know likely they're going to be trying to put out fires. You know, as the data breach unfolds, and and you kind of continue to uh, unpack what what that leads to. Uh, and I think bringing in an outside vendor, um, you know, can afford you a better insight into potential threats associated with specific. Uh, uh, APTs, uh, foreign nation states, or criminal actors in the cyberspace, and so having somebody come in and really start to work, uh, you know, hey, the identification of of uh, of the threat on your network, uh, the containment, eradication, and then the you know, remediation piece, uh, some or all of that uh, being uh, pushed to an outside vendor can be very helpful as you try and stand your network uh, back up and get resume normal business operations. Yeah, for sure. And I'll just piggyback on that. In, in addition, forensic firms, right, um, can bring additional tools, methodologies to help us with that containment and restoration. They may also be dealing with five or 10 other of very similar matters, right? So we also bring through the forensic firms, bring that sort of uh, expertise knowledge uh, on the exact situation. Um, but they also, you know, can deploy endpoint monitoring tools which are you know advanced monitoring to really help us with containment and restoration uh, but also it's sort of become expected um, especially we see this in litigation but in, in regulatory investigations as well that when you are suffering a, a, a data security incident that it's you know, enterprise-wide um, that you bring in a third party right get around that argument of the fox guarding the henhouse 
certainly we need the on-site, you know, internal staff um, to certainly be, be, be the main point of contact, but to be able to utilize a third party uh, forensic firm that only br not only brings the knowledge, but you also bring that sort of independent set of eyes uh, that can either validate, right, what, what internal folks are seeing or certainly help supplement the forensic investigation. Um, thank you, Don. Thank you both. Um, Matt, one of, one of the questions that came in relates to how important is it to have a communications plan or strategy or expert like yourself uh, to assist uh, when these events occur? Well, I think for a lot of the reasons that, that Dom and Gunnar just talked about, uh, it is important to have that uh, that kind of external expertise. And, you know, certainly for the reasons of resourcing, you know, a lot of organizations may have, you know, a communications professional on staff. They may be very good at, uh, you know, marketing their products or services, but they may have no idea of how to how to deal with communications as it relates to uh, a data breach or a cyber incident. And as as all the legal team well know, um, it's it's a very precise scripted sort of process with a lot of requirements that go to the legal compliance angles that uh, a communications professional may, may be very well intended uh, in terms of, of trying to, to keep their key audiences informed of what's going on during what can be a very emotional event um, and, and run afoul of, of the accepted process. So um, finding, finding outside uh, communications counsel that specializes in, in this sort of communications, in this sort of environment, to work closely with the legal team, I think it's just, just a really critical success factor in, in moving through these situations. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, especially you know, with the proliferation of uh, all of the different types of social media, I think it's it's more important now than ever. Um, let's see, somebody had asked, you know, if my organization doesn't have a lot of personally identifiable information, credit cards, protected health information, do I really need cyber liability coverage? Uh, yes, <laughs> so the short answer is absolutely. Um, one of the things that we find is you may not have a lot of personally identifiable information of your clients perhaps, or um, you, know, you may not have a lot of PHI, personal health information, but you process credit cards. Obviously, that's where an insurance policy comes into play. If you're uh, processing large amounts of credit cards, obviously, you have to be in compliance with the uh, payment card industry for any fines and assessments. There's also something to consider with employee information as well. Um, I also like to remind clients that you're probably signing NDAs and confidentiality agreements. Uh, so, you know, in order to be in compliance, you may need to notify. So, those are all important aspects and and really reinforces the need to have cyber liability insurance. Um, you know, if you're a manufacturer too, and you're down for any length of time as a result of a cyber liability incident, you may not have really a lot of any of that information, but what is gonna hurt you the most is that cyber business interruption. Um, and that can be offset by a cyber liability policy for any kind of business income loss as a result of a non-physical business interruption. Because your property policy is only going to respond to a physical, business interruption, so fire, et cetera. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dom, there was a question that came in asking, you know, do I really need someone who specializes in this on the legal side? Can't we just use our normal corporate counsel to advise when these events occur? So this is certainly, you know, uh, a situation where timing is very important, but also the knowledge, the experience, and the connections, right? If you are certainly down and out, right? Um, you've been potentially ransomed, right? You're encrypted, you can't make the widgets. Uh, this is not the time to sort of, you know, figure out who who can help me on the legal side. You know, my, my, my corporate attorney, um, who do you know that we can get in here to help? The, the forensic firms, um, A, are, you know, certainly very busy, but B, to be able to get them on the line within five minutes, right, which which we can do. So just to have those relationships already um, in your back pocket, as we do as privacy counsel, this is all that we do, right, day in, day out, help organizations in responding to, to breaches. Um, but, you know, other 
uh, other great contacts that, that we have include, right, FBI and Secret Service. Um, and, and going back really quick to forensics, we may be seeing, you know, five or ten of the same matter. And we say, oh, this firm, you know, has been helping uh, the, these on this type of variant of ransomware or, you know, this email compromise, which looks very similar. So we can sort of, again, leverage that experience um, and knowledge and, and really, you know, be able to expedite the process. Um, and then when it comes time to, if we have to notify individuals, right, which is often a very, you know, sort of onerous deep dive due diligence of the, the data you have, where folks reside, all of the laws that are in place, like we talked about state, federal, international, um, industry guidelines and recommendations. So there's, there's a lot to have to digest there. But if we do have to notify them to be able to have the notification vendors that can help us with printing and mailing letters and setting up a call center overnight to handle, you know, potentially millions of, of notifications and, and calls. So it's that experience, the connections, um, and, and to be able to respond, uh, at a moment's notice is why we really strongly uh, recommend that they bring in experienced privacy counsel. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Gunnar, one question that came in is, you know, when I do need to bring in the the experts on the forensic side, you know, should I be looking to bring in somebody local because they need to come on site or can I reach out to MCPC? How how can you assist if you're not in my backyard, if you will? Well, that, that's a great question. And, and that has kind of evolved over time. You know, I know that a lot of the uh, insurance providers you know, have relationships with certain vendors. Uh, who will do a lot of this work remotely. Um, so the answer is kind of it's really up to you. Uh, your insurance company you know, may say, hey, use this uh, vendor uh, who's going to contain the, uh, the data breach, uh, identify or eradicate it, and, and then maybe, you know, uh, maybe out of the equation at that point, and then bring in another firm who's local or not local for remediation because you need uh, help on site. So it really depends on the type of data breach, but I think it's it ties back into you know, what Matt said in his first question, having that, that plan in place and uh, vendors and, and law enforcement identified already uh, you know, so that you know who to call when it happens. Um, and if that's you know, a firm like us, you know, if you're in the Cleveland area or you know, in our region, in the Great Lakes area, or uh, somebody more local, uh, just having those people kind of uh, you know, in your Rolodex, so to speak, and know who they are. So uh, when it happens on a Friday night at, uh, at 8 p.m., uh, you, you can uh, reach out to somebody who's going to, you know, is going to answer the phone and can can provide help and assistance uh, immediately and don't have to wait too long to try and, and find somebody and, and work through some of those uh, those motions. Excellent. Thank you. Um, great, great response. Totally agree that, uh, you know, we want to get the best resources we can to folks and they don't need to be in their backyard. Um, Matt, one question that came in relates to, you know, how prepared should folks be with some type of communication plan, uh, even if it's kind of a skeletal plan, you know, should they have something like that prepared or discussed before these types of events occur? Uh, that's a great question, and I, I think it's an unequivocal yes. You need to have some framework of, of a plan in advance, and the, the beauty of that is that you know right now you're you're not in the middle of a crisis situation uh, when you're scrambling to get people together to gather information in a very fluid high pressure situation so it's 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 not only the right thing to do it's a very smart thing to do and i think the most successful plans um, don't try to address every potential eventuality they instead give you a framework for how you're going to um, how you're going to communicate how you're going to make decisions about what to communicate and when so then regardless of the type of situation that you face, and invariably, they're all going to be different. Um, you, have a, you have a process for answering whatever comes your way, regardless of what it is. And those are the most effective in, in terms of being able to, uh, to effectively communicate during a crisis situation, and, and those, those will just simply work for you the best. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, Dom, uh, somebody had asked the question of, you know, as we look in the crystal ball from a legislative perspective or regulatory perspective, what do you see coming down the road that's going to impact this area? 
Sure. We always get that question of, you know, why can't we just have one data breach notice law? They've done it in EU. Canada seems to have it together. Australia did one. Um, and for as long as, as our team has been doing this for, for well over a decade into 13 years now, 14 years, uh, we have yet to see any progress on, on that front. We are left with all 50 states having their own separate data breach notice laws, so a patchwork of, of all these breach notifications, and they're all very different, um, and we constantly see updates and amendments to those breach notification laws where um, state legislatures are adding in more into their definition of what is considered to be protected personal information, right? So we're growing the potential population of a breach because the data points are growing. We're also seeing them narrow the time in which we have to notify um, from a reasonable amount of time down to, you know, 30, 45 days. Um, but on the, that's on the breach notification sort of reactive side, where I think we're going to see some real movement um, is on sort of the, the proactive side, right, of the uh, the the laws such as the California right uh, Consumer Protection Act CCPA, there is a whole host of requirements. Um, just as we saw with GDPR internationally, we've seen California pretty much adopt GDPR, and there's a whole host of requirements that are required um, proactively, right, to be uh, requiring certain technical safeguards in place on the front end. Um, committing to certain privacy policy and rights to be forgotten if someone wants to be, you know, deleted and erased from, from your database. Um, so I think we're going to see more states follow um, in the footsteps of California, where we're going to see a lot more sort of information security protection acts on the front end. But of course, we're going to continue to see um, amendments on the data breach notification side, but I would not hold your breath on any kind of uniform federal United States breach notification law. Thanks, Tom. And it certainly sounds like this is an issue that continues to remain on the front burner, if you will, that uh, it's not going away. And it's certainly something that is going to have the attention of uh, regulators and legislators uh, going forward. Um, a couple of other questions. Uh, Lacey, um, one question that came in is, won't the cyber insurance carrier want to use their own providers or vendors? Uh, yes, absolutely. Their, most carriers have panel providers that um, you're either required to use or you um, need to use them unless you pre-negotiate um, using your own your own provider. So, for instance, they want to understand have these have these folks um, handled situations before. If so, how deep is their bench? Do they have a lot of expertise? What are the hourly rates? Um, it's also important to know if you're going off of panel, you may be paying more than you would if you used a panel provider because there's usually rate caps. So those are all important things to consider. Um, you know, usually the carriers panel providers are all um, larger organizations that have handled thousands of incidents. So this is certainly not their first time handling it. And that's why the carriers would prefer that you use them. However, there are some carriers where there's little to no deviation. So I always like to um, advise my clients of that because you know, it can be problematic and I understand uh, why someone would want to use the folks that they're familiar with, but I don't remember, I think Dom, um, or I'm not sure if it was Gunnar, <laughs> who mentioned the fox in the hen house after something's happened, right? So, you know, sometimes it's good to have a third party that's not familiar with your system come and do the audit afterwards and determine if they're really out as well. Well, yeah, that's great information and it, it is very important to make sure that uh, you are coordinating and working through your insurance carrier because the last thing you want to do is get down the road with a provider and learn that they are not approved and having to start over again. So I think very important. Um, I know we're kind of getting to the end of our time, so I, I want to kind of kick it around the table and uh, just ask each of you, you didn't know this was coming, so surprise, 
but uh, ask each of you for just you know one takeaway that all of our listeners, as they walk out, you've provided some just exceedingly valuable information, but it's a lot. So what is the one thing that as folks walk out the door, they should do immediately? And, and, and I'll start, uh, Lacey, I'll start with you. So um, I would take a look, if you don't have an insurance policy, I would get one. Uh, we're seeing substantial increases in cyber related events. So if you do have policy in place and it's been in place for a number of years, is that still the right policy limit for you? Um, it may be time to consider increasing it. Um, and then also, you know, make sure you're doing, looking at your incident response plan and maybe doing tabletop exercises. Excellent advice. And I can tell you, it, I'm always uh, feel horrible when I'm talking to clients and they don't have coverage and it's all out of pocket. So, you know, please do reach out, uh, reach out to Lacey, reach out to someone who truly understands what she's talking about and can be of assistance to you. Um, next, I'll, I'll kick it over to Matt. Matt, what's your one takeaway? Well, certainly lots of good information here. I, I think the one thing I would suggest is that um, data security is not um, simply an IT function. Um, this is a, a much broader and can be a much broader reputational issue. So to assume, for any organization to assume that, oh, you know, Sally, our IT person will, will handle this and, you know, we don't have to worry about it, I think is a, is a serious mistake. It needs to be you know, a top level driven uh, initiative to, to make data security uh, a top priority, uh, to make ensure that it's well funded, to ensure that you're well prepared in advance for all the reasons that we talked about earlier. It just has to have C-suite advocacy uh, in order to be you know, given the respect and concern that these sorts of threats can provide. That's, that's the one thing I would tell any of my clients that, you know, as you're getting prepared for this, you're going to get hit at some point. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how bad. Um, decide how you want to address that as a real threat to your business. Excellent and, and a great, great, great piece of advice, Matt. Thank you for all of your remarks, but that is, uh, that's a great point. Um, Gunnar, I'll go to you next. Great, and thanks. Uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, know what your cybersecurity strategy is and, and how you, you know, define a, a roadmap for uh, your industry compliance, whatever that may be. And, and that encompasses kind of a lot, but certainly would start with you know, having a risk assessment done uh, so you can see what the landscape in your company looks like. And that includes things, uh, you know, could include things like reviewing your insurance policy um, and, and what that coverage looks like and making sure it's comprehensive and, and it meets your needs. Uh, looking at all your policies and procedures in-house, um, you know, defining those uh, those uh, business continuity plans, disaster recovery plans, incident response plans, tabletop exercises, you know, really maps out a, a strategy for a year, uh, which really puts you in a great position in, in a fairly short period of time. Thank you very much for your time today. Gunnar, thanks for the insight. Uh, great thoughts, uh, much appreciated. And last but certainly not least, Dom, what's your uh, what's your what's your one final takeaway? Yeah, get 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 the team together. Figure out, you know, obviously you want an incident response plan, but figure out who is on your team. You may have never thought about it, right? Um, we want to make sure that 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 team a understands that they're even on the incident response team, uh, and b that that we've tested tested the plan tested the team, right? Uh, figure out internally who's going to be on your team, but also externally. It's never um, too early to, if you do have cyber coverage, reach out to your carrier, find out who are, if it is a requirement for a panel, figure out who are the privacy council. Talk to us, right? Get to know us before uh, the, the, the inevitable happens, right? And so while things are calm, vetting legal, Reach out to maybe a couple of forensic firms um, to figure out who you may want to use uh, if the inevitable occurs. So get the plan in place and get the team in place, both internal and external team. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, great advice as always. And, uh, you know, whenever we deal with these events, I always tell clients that there are many, many moving parts when we're dealing with one of these events and they all have sharp edges. So. We want to make sure we engage the folks that truly do this day in and day out. And, you know, 
as we come to a close of this session of the Cyber Master Class Series presented by McDonald Hopkins and MCPC, I do want to thank Lacey and Dom, Matt and Gunner for joining us. Your experience, uh, your advice, uh, greatly appreciated. And I do want to remind everyone to please remember to save the date for our next session, which is October 29. Uh, you'll be receiving a link to rewatch the video of today's webinar and slides and a follow-up email within the next couple of days. And if you have any additional questions as a result of today's webinar, please reach out to us at the contact information that's on the screen. And again, thank you all for joining us and stay healthy.